Thank you. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. I'm Gabriel Sanders, and I'm the public programs producer here at the museum. I want to thank everyone for coming out today for this live event, a live podcast recording of The Last Generation with Maddie Kramer and Mark Schoenwetter and his family. Um, thank you everyone who's tuning in online. We appreciate you being here. This event is a part of our Story Survive series, which is um, the museum's way of telling survivors stories, um, direct survivors and their descendants, 2Gs, 3Gs, and as it continues into future generations. We're very honored and excited to have Mark Schoenwetter here with his grandchildren for the special podcast recording that Maddie Kramer has designed, and I'm gonna hand it to Maddie in just a second um, to tell more about it. Um, for grandchildren to be able to speak with their grandparents who are survivors and tell their stories, know their stories. Um, for those who are not members here at the museum, I would like to invite you to become one and enjoy exclusive uh, preview to exhibitions, free admission to our um, exhibitions, and um, it's really the best way to support the museum. We currently have a few exhibitions on view, The Holocaust, What Hate Can Do, Survivors, Faces of Life After the Holocaust, Photographs by Martin Scholler, and The Garden of Stones by Andy Goldsworthy. We're very excited for this fall when we'll be opening Courage to Act, Rescue in Denmark. It's the museum's first exhibition for visitors nine and up, and it's about the incredible story of the Danish rescue. So be on the lookout for that exhibition opening. Um, you can connect with the museum online on our website and see our upcoming public programs there. Again, thank you so much for coming, and I'm going to hand things over now to Maddie Kramer. Um, please enjoy the program. So, uh, welcome everyone. I'm Maddie Kramer. I'm going to be the moderator and the host for today's event. Uh, the first of many live episodes, hopefully, from The Last Generation and the collaboration with the museum of Jewish heritage. Uh, welcome Mark, uh, Lexi, Ashley, Jason, and Jared. And thank you for being part of the episode nine of the, of the podcast. We're really have, lucky to have you. Um, the Last Generation podcast is about bringing generations together to have candid and scripted conversations. Together with Pico Music, we created the podcast because as a granddaughter of a survivor myself, I never had the chance to ask all the questions I would like to have from her life, you know, from before, during, and after the war. So I wanted to give others the platform to, and a space to have that conversation. Now, uh, Lexi, uh, Ashley, Jason, and Jerry will give you the space to start talking and asking all these questions to your grandpa. Uh, first of all, if you can introduce yourself so we have it in the recording, but this is your space. Imagine you're like in your house talking with your grandpa. I want you to like, have as many questions as you want and obviously uh, enjoy it. Thank you so much for being part of this. Thank you. Yes, you, <laughs> oh, you can introduce yourself. So. <laughs> okay, can I? Just say, so, um, oh. just say your name. <laughs> <laughs> what I want to say is August 12, 1942. My father was murdered by the Nazis. August 12, 2004, my grandson was born and was given a name after my father, Israel. Just wanna say, her Adolf Hitler you did not succeed. And you will never succeed. Happy birthday, Jared. Mm -hmm. And I, all of you kids, my grandkids, love you. We love you too. <laughs> we love you too. Thank you. So can you say your name for the recording, Mark? Your full name, and your age, if you want. No name. <laughs> 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 
ages of history. <laughs> I am Mark Schoenwetter. I am a Holocaust survivor. I was born in Poland in a small little village named Brzostek, and that's where my parents, my grandparents, maybe great-grandparents lived till 19, let's say 41 or 42, where they were murdered by the Nazis. Uh, yeah, so I'm Jason Fisk. Um, I am Poppy's grandson, and Isabella is my mom. Poppy's. <laughs> I'm Ashley, and my mom is Anne. <laughs> I'm Lexi, and my mom is also Anne. <laughs> uh, I'm Jared. Uh, I'm Poppy's youngest grandson, <laughs> and I am on the Isabella side. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Maddie, for having us. So we just want to start off with one question that we think may be the hardest question. So just be prepared. Who's your favorite grandchild? It's you don't have to answer. You don't have to answer. We know it's In me. one word, <laughs> I can say, Jared. Oh, <laughs> oh, we're done. We're done. Wait, we're done. Max, <laughs> Ashley, and Jason. Saving the best for last. <laughs> so, yeah. the first question we really did want to ask, though, is family is really important to us. And we wanted to know what the relationship uh, with your sister was like uh, at the beginning of the war and how it changed throughout the war and into your teenage years. Well, my relation with my sister before the war, I have to say it was very little relation because I was like five years old. She was about two years old, two and a half years old. So we didn't have any, any connection, too small to, to understand between a relation between two siblings. Now, during the war, when we had to escape from our village and then go to the ghetto, or when we were hiding in the forest, or if we were hiding in somebody's house, a farmer's house, our relations became little bit slowly more, more closer to each other because simply saying when we were hiding in a place there were three of us my mom my sister and me and by hiding we were kind of told by the Farber family that we cannot talk, we have to be quiet. So our relation grew from, say it, talking to each other, but whispering. Just because that's all what we could afford to do is whisper to each other. And slowly, slowly, it was only two of us. So our relation was getting closer and closer and closer. And continued, I have to say, till today. Because every Sunday, I pick up the phone and I call my sister, which lives in Israel, and we have a conversation. So we have a great relation. I love that. I love that. Yeah. What about your father? Do you remember what he was like before? Um, before the war started, what? Do you have any specific memory that stands out about him? Well, unfortunately, I have to say that I don't have much memory of my father 
because as I mentioned, he was killed in 1942. And before that already, we escaped a little bit before that to a ghetto and we didn't have contact with him. So my memory, unfortunately, I have to say, it's very slim about my father and me. So obviously, despite ever meeting your father from my perspective, um, I've always felt a special bond with your father. Um, obviously, as you said before, he was, he, uh, he was murdered on uh, August 12th. Um, in 1942, and I was uh, born August 12th, just 2004, and my Hebrew name is Segev Yisrael, named after both of your um, parents, but I've always felt a special bond with him and a special connection. So when you finally found out that, you went back years later, um, and you found a tombstone at the site of, um, at, the, at the site of the mass murdering of your father and many other Jews, and you saw it labeled with August 12th, what was your reaction when seeing that? And I guess for everybody, walk us through kind of what happened to your father. Well, what happened at that day, I have to say that in the beginning, i be very frank with you, somehow didn't connect the two dates I mean, this one day with two people. But then, when I got home, and I talked to your mom, my daughter, and I mentioned it, and then the whole picture came in front of my eyes. Here is my grandson, and I just came from a place that I said the first time, I know the second time, I said Kaddish for my father in this, on this day of the memorial when they opened the area where the mass grave was there. So it, it was something so emotional to me. Now what was the next? And just describe what happened to your father and how, and how you ended up finding out about the whole situation, about how he passed. Yeah, well, the way we found out what happened to my father was during the war, while we were hiding in the forest, there was a Polish family from Trostek who happened to live in our house. My father gave him two rooms. And while we were hiding, occasionally, Mr. Piwat, the head of the family, or his son-in-law, used to come to the forest and bring us a piece of bread or something to eat. One time when he did not come, his son-in-law came in, and he mentioned, no, and my mother noticed that he is wearing a pair of shoes. And she's asking him, where did you get those shoes? And he kind of resisted, didn't want to explain to her. But after a few words, he says, okay, let me tell you. One day, the Germans came with the trucks to our village, to Brostek. They asked for young Polish guys to go to work. They loaded up the truck or two trucks. They took him to the forest and they told him to dig a big hole. After we were done, they took us back to the village. Then they came back and they took us back to work. When we were going to this place, we didn't know where we go to work. All of a sudden we see we're going in exactly the same direction, the same place. So when we came to this forest and we look in this big hole that we digged before is full with dead people. Because what the Germans did, they brought 
about 250 men, women, and children. They strip them naked, tell them to take the clothes off, line up all the clothes on the side, then line them up and they kill them. So they told us to cover the whole area so it wouldn't be visible or show that it's something there. So after we did everything, then they told us, go and pick one item from all the goods that you see here for the work that you did. So he says, I was walking around, what to pick, all of a sudden I see shoes. When I look at the shoes, I notice the pair of shoes that your husband was wearing because I work with him every day on the farm. So for the memory of his, I pick those shoes. So he tells my mom, now you know that your husband was murdered and he is in this forest in this mass grave. That's how we found out what happened to our to my father. And so during the war, how did your mom explain to you what was happening? Well, mom wasn't much explaining to us what was happening because honestly, we did not know what was actually happening. Because while we were hiding, there was no information, there was no newspapers, there was no radios, of course. There was no any way to get the information what's going on. So we actually didn't know about any concentration camps. And we knew that if they find a Jew, they will kill him. That's why we're hiding. But what actually was happening we did not know. Um, I had a question about maybe a couple years after the war, or about the time you were in high school. Were your friends ever anti-Semitic to you, or did you have more Jewish friends? So after the war, what was post-war anti-Semitism like, if there was any, in Poland? Well, Right after the war, in the high school, for example, I was the only Jewish kid in this high school. Wow. There was another high school which was for girls, and my sister and another Jewish girl, they were the only two Jewish kids mm. in the other high school. So. <clears throat> Actually, we didn't know what anti-Semitism means even mm -hmm. at that time. Right. And also, in that period of time, Poland was a communist nation. So under the communist regime, theoretically, it was that everybody is equal, that you cannot hate anybody. So we didn't feel anything mm -hmm. as far as anti-Semitism, because everybody was afraid to say anything huh. <laughs> to live under the communist regime. So then, if you didn't have many Jewish people after the war there, when you went to Israel, how did it feel all of a sudden being surrounded by so many people that have had similar experiences as you, who were raised similar to you? <laughs> it was really an uh, experience because, let me give you an example. Before we left to Israel, we still lived in Poland. And for example, We were, on a Sunday, we used to go to a, see a movie. But before the movie start, they used to show like news, 
news reel was very short something. And what they were showing, they were showing the war, the Suez War, that time Israel fighting uh, Egypt. And okay, we didn't know even about that. But we saw it, okay. So, but after we walked out and we were standing and talking, and there is another, all the few people standing next to us, and they say, did you see this news about those Israelis and fighting? We say, yeah, yeah. Can you see? Those Jews, they say the Jews, the Israelis supposed to be Jews too. But they different Jews than we know those Jews in Poland. They so different, they go on tanks. They have airplanes, they have trucks, they have machine guns. Those not the same Jews that we know. Why I am saying this? So when we came to Israel, and all of a sudden we see it's only Jewish people. We couldn't believe, look at this. Jewish people having their own country, they have buses, they have trains, they, they, they go, that's not the same Jews that we know. We couldn't visualize that this could be a Jewish country and be only, be, we are only between Jews alone, nobody else. So it was really a different experience, a different outlook of the Israeli population, call it which is Jewish, but it's Israeli. So for as long as I can remember, you've always been very, like obviously what happened to you is horrible, you've been very prideful of your story and you share it so much because you want everybody to know it so it doesn't happen again. But I can imagine that directly, like immediately post-war, it wasn't something that you were sharing, especially in the communist regime and everything, so did it, did you become so comfortable telling your story and so wanting to share it once you went to Israel, surrounded by a more, I'd say, welcoming community? Or did, did it uh, start to happen when you came to America? As far as for me to share what happened during this period of time, it came basically when I came to the United States and when I married, got my two kids, and they will start growing a little bit, going to school, then I felt that it's time to share what happened to me during the war so they know, and I was slowly, slowly telling them my story. And that's how the whole thing started with me to share with everybody besides, of course, my grandkids and my everybody else. So I know, I remember when I was younger, I, uh, I had a lot of anti-Semitic experiences and I called you one time to talk to you about it, um, just like, how do, you, how do I handle this? I don't know what to do. And me, I'm just calling my poppy. You know, he knows what he's talking about. But thinking back on it now, older, I can't, I can't even imagine what might have been going through your head with everything going on. Do you remember that? Do you remember, you know, what, as your children, your grandchildren are going out into the real world and we're facing this anti-Semitism today still, what goes through your head with that? Well, to go through the anti-Semitism which goes on today, we 
my view is a little bit different than general view is on it, on this subject. Because I feel that anti-Semitism has been around for ages, thousands of years. But now, we making from it such a big issue, which of course we have to, but sometimes we going out of our way even. Because for example, sometimes they accusing young kids because they had some place made a sign of a swastika, or they hang the picture of Hitler somewhere. And I've been a few times involved with speaking with those kids, because I'm speaking to schools and to kids, so they were asking me. So when I got to talk to those kids, those kids didn't have the slightest idea what a swastika means, why the picture of Hitler is not right to hang or talk about them, who he is. I don't know who he is, they tell me. I thought it's funny. So I went and I did it. So my outlook on those situations is that it's lack of education from the, I would say even, from the youngest, youngest child going to school. You have to teach and explain to the kids the history. If you do that, and then you see that somebody that's the knowledge of it, and it's doing, well, then we have the issue. But first, we have to make sure that we did our share, and we taught the young generation what actually happened in the past. In other words, we have to teach them the history and it's not only about the Jewish people. They should know the history of everybody else. So then you wouldn't have uh, Asians, you wouldn't have uh, Armenians. They were pressed too. So I think this should be addressed by the people who run this country. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, no. Uh, so when my mom wrote her book, Together, A Journey for Survival, was it hard having your life so open for everyone to read about? Well, my life, this life to be open, I feel it should be open. I feel people should know it's not me that went through. This is, should be an example that what happened to me, call it fortunately for me that I survived, unfortunately for more other people that did not survive, but they went through, before they were killed, all kind of, who knows what horrible things they went through in their life. So it is right to write a book and explain what happened, so people have some knowledge what happened at that time. It's not just a fantasy, it's reality of it. On the topic of sharing your story and educating other people, I would love for you to talk about the Mark Schoenwetter Holocaust Education Foundation and what that's been like starting it and speaking to all these different schools. 
um, and the foundation itself with our moms. Well, when I start speaking to schools, to schools, to the kids, and usually when I was going to speak many times, one of my daughters were with me, and after we start talking to the teachers, and they were so happy too that I presented and talked about it. But then we were saying, you know, you should teach the kids, the kids should read books and have knowledge about it, what happened and so far. But they say, yeah, we should, yeah, but we don't have money to buy books. So we say, what do you mean we, you don't have money? The school doesn't have a few dollars to buy a, a book and give it to the kid? No, 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 we don't have, no budget. So that's when my two daughters, Isabella and Anne, came with an idea. If we create a Holocaust Foundation and right away the money which we're getting, we're going to give to the schools so they can buy books, take the kids to the high, to, to museums, to any place and teach them about the Holocaust. And that's when they decided and we decided to create the foundation. And I have to say, no, we do good, but we should do much, much better yet. And we're doing our most, in particular, Isabella and Anne. But we need support. We need more people giving us donation so we can take and turn around the money into right away into education give to the schools. So maybe this way, by doing it, maybe one day we will see that we achieve something that our future generation be safe. It never happens anything like it again. I think um, one of the misconceptions that people have about the Holocaust is whenever I say, yeah, my grandfather is a Holocaust survivor, there is, oh, what camp was he in, right? Um, and so there's that misconception that just because you're a Holocaust survivor means that you were in a camp, and that's not the case for you. So when did you realize, like, I am a Holocaust survivor? Because it must have taken a bit to settle in. Well. People kind of assume in, instantly that if you survive the Holocaust, you survive a concentration camp, a labor camp. Why? Because the focus is not to take a group of people on a trip, let's say, I'm saying because I am from Poland, take him to Poland and bring him to a forest and show him the forest. You know, there were three people, five people hiding here and they survived. They live under those conditions, they said, no. But what they do, they take the people, they travel to Poland and they go to Auschwitz. Well, Auschwitz, yeah. It's a concentration camp. Guest chambers, that's where people were killed. And the 
they focusing on this part. So that's why people automatically, if you say that you are a Holocaust survivor, what camp did you have? Where, they, where were you hiding? Where were you been in which one? In the, uh, Auschwitz or Buchenwald or wherever that was. Which is, okay, normal because the advertising is the color color in this direction. How was, uh, many years ago now, uh, we had, like it was probably one of the most impactful trips of my life, but you were able to take us to Poland and really walk us through your experience and where you were hiding and who you were hiding with. And we even got to uh, go back to your old home and uh, your family ended up giving the home to the Piwat family as a thank you. And they still had an area of that home um, in the corner of their yard still from like the original woodwork. So how was that being able to bring your grandchildren back to Poland, back to Brostek, back to an area that has so much hard memories, but being able to walk us through your experiences and your story? How did that make you feel? Well, it was my dream always to take my grandkids, go with them, and show them where my family, where I used to live, how does it look? So this way they have an idea to, a visual idea, see themselves where I live, where my family live. Because this way you have a different outlook. Your outlook about the whole thing, I think, changes if you see by yourself with your own eyes the location where it was, what happened, not like you would think, oh, somebody tells me, I don't know even what it means. It's, it, I feel it's so much different to personally visualize this and see it. I mean, I, that was definitely impactful for me because I mean, I've heard your story so many times of being able to hear, like, yeah, I've heard of the pigsty that you were kept in, see but being it. able to see it and like being able to like, I mean, I still can't comprehend, but being able to somewhat comprehend the fact that you lived there for months on end without any movement, it was like even more eye-opening than your actual story because I was able to see it firsthand, which was really incredible experience for me and I know all of us. Um, so now that you have four grandchildren in college or out of college or almost out of college, I think all four of us hope one day to take our own kids back to Poland and show them what their great-grandfather went through. What would be something that you would want to tell to our future kids, not only about your experience, but about how it shaped who you are and how it shaped the Schoenwetter lineage? Well, <laughs> it, would be, it would be good, you know, if you want. Don't let me wait too long, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe, you know, if, if luck would let me, you know, to be lucky, maybe I could join you yet. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> So we've heard so many stories from you and so many stories from our moms just about them growing up and staying in Livingston, but family is not the only thing that's important to you. It's those family traditions that we create or that you create. And I wanted to give you the floor to explain our pot potato laka tradition and other ones that I know that will pass down for generations. It's just cool story and traditions that I would love for you to talk about. Well, let's start with the potato latkes. <laughs> Maybe we should 
maybe we should add one other occasion. So instead of have it only once a year, maybe we should do it twice a year, <laughs> <laughs> at least, you know? Yeah. So the tradition would be, you know, remembered yeah. more often. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So when you talk to your sister now every Sunday, do you guys ever talk about your experience? Or have you talked about your experience together? Or do you kind of not talk about what you both went through together? Well, we, we do occasionally have this subject. Because if there is an event some kind of, a, and, I, and she's following, you know, one the social media, you know, on Facebook or whatever, what it is, and we bring the subject and talk. So we do mention certain things, and so you remember this, or you remember that. So we do, but we're not making a big issue out of it anymore, but we do come across this subject. Mm -hmm. So now you're, you've now been a part of uh, the raising of directly six kids, essentially, your two kids and us four grandchildren. <laughs> and how, when we were at the ages of six or seven, the age that you were during the war, how did that look or how did that feel to see us living completely opposite lives to the life that you lived and your childhood? Well, it was, I would say it was a pleasure to see my kids and then my grandkids living, would I say normal life? Probably as much as you can say normal life. And if something came like an example, like I mentioned once to your mom, wow, look, he's so old. You know, when I was in this age, I had to hide. I couldn't say one word. But take a look. Take a look. Now they hear and they can do basically whatever they can do. They don't have to be hungry. They don't have to be uh, freezing outside in summertime with sweating. Not to, take a, uh, not to take a shower, not wash yourself. You see, they can do all those things. Don't you see how nice and, and, and lucky they are? How did you keep yourself sane all of those years? I mean, I could barely go five minutes without talking. <laughs> how, can, how were you able to go that long just staying still, not doing anything, and having to just lie there? Well, I, <laughs> I always say that I do all, did, or my sister, that we both did, lie not to say anything and be later on in life more positive of everything, looking forward to the future, only because of my mother. Because my mother was the, I consider her, the greatest woman in the world. Because for me, for my sister, we here, thanks to her, and she was always looking forward 
with a positive outlook of life. If we cry, we were hungry, we were uh, dirty, we, we were freezing, and we cried and complained, she always responded to us with a smile on her face, always telling us, you see, you hungry? We're going to go and find something to eat. And we're going to eat, it will be fine. Don't worry about it. Look forward, we will get it. If we were freezing, wait, wait till tomorrow, we're going to find a place, a farmer is going to take us in, and we'll be in the house, and we'll be okay. Always had the excuse to look forward the positive way. So that's why if we were going through all those things, slowly, slowly, we kind of fell into this trend of being satisfied, positive looking, hoping for the best. I never got to meet your mother, Baba Sala, but uh I hear just like the strongest characteristics related to her. Um, so you talk about her optimism and how optimistic she was throughout the war. Like a lot of parents are able to just do that because their kids are young and they have to. As you grew up, was your mom the exact same? Like was, did, did you see that strength just stay with her throughout her entire life? Or do you think that was something that she definitely had to push forward because you guys were so little in the situation that you were in? Well, later on in life, when we grew up already, she continued to be maybe a little different way, different outlook in different directions because the circumstances life circumstances changed and we were doing different things. So according to that, she was kind of trying to guide us and give us ideas. So, and we always kind of listened to her because we felt that she has a point. She has a point. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> we didn't know what time we were at. Well, I, I see there, you guys have some questions about like, you know, how he coped with hunger, like a little more of like his story of like how he felt, you know, when he was uh, hiding, you know. I'd like, love to know, Mark, you know, like, obviously it, it was, really hard imagine being, you know, in these places and hiding. So like, do you have a feeling or remember of like, like when, if you were hungry at that time, like do you, were you playing in your mind food? Like what was it that was going through your mind at that time? Like how to pass that time? You know, it would be really interesting to know. Like, well, there was many, many, many times that for example, we were hungry because in particular when we lived and hide in the forest, basically the only food that we had was to find something which grows in the forest, like mushrooms, berries, or anything, walk around, find it, and pick it up and eat. Sometimes we didn't find for a day or two. What were you doing then? We were hungry. <laughs> and waiting and walking around more and more to try to find something, finally, to find a spot where they could grow. Okay, then we grabbed and we ate. It was a little bit easier when we were hiding in the farmer's house 
because usually the farmer at least twice a day gave us something to eat. So it was so much better. I'd say that in most sibling relationships, there's you know, definitely a crankier one when you're young, and I'll take the ownership in that. That was, that was definitely me, and knowing these two girls, it was probably Lexi. <laughs> um, but, I mean, you guys were so young, and your sister was even younger, but you're someone that never complains to this day. It does not matter what it is, you will not complain. Like, I imagine that's something that was instilled to you, just like to stay quiet and not complain when you were young, but was that just always who you were? Like, were you a complainer and were you cranky during those times in the pigsty? Or was like your sister the one crying? Cause, Cause I mean, you guys must have, you guys must have not been happy complaining a lot. Like you guys were young, you guys had every right to be. Well, we were, and again, we complained. My mother was listening, but again, her approach, her answers, were not like crying with us. As I mentioned before, her answers were so more positive. So, you know, on a friendly basis, not screaming at us. Are you screaming again? Are you... Uh, crying again, leave me alone already. No, never, never like it. Going back to your father, so you ended up finding out, uh, you ended up finding out that he passed when you were in the ghetto. Um, did you have time, because I know you were constantly hiding, but I guess the time in the ghetto was the time when you were the most in place. Did you have time to grieve his death? And did you like have any moment where you were able to really like have some sort of funeral or honorary moment for him during the war? Or was that after the war where you were able to really sit down and reflect and take in everything? Well, honestly, during the war, never, never came across anything to think about it. We were too small maybe to understand this whole situation. Mom never brought the situation up, so we never talked about it. And then after the war, we knew automatically, because we found out as kids, that he was killed. So this subject usually we never touched. We lived with it, with the knowledge, but we never, never talked about it. What were your... Um emotions or thoughts when you were coming out of hiding and the war seemed to be at its end, what were those feelings for you and your family? Well, after we were liberated by the army, the Soviet Union army, and we came back to our own ho old house, it was strange. We kind of weren't sure how to behave ourselves. We were happy, but again, my mom told us, be happy, we're free, we don't have to hide, we're back in our house, but let's keep our eyes and ears open in mm -hmm. here, because we don't know for sure what's going on after the war. You see, so we kind of, again, had to be a little bit on a tense side with the situation. So when do you remember being able to finally just relax and just be, you know? Was that he still during know. Israel? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Was that when you got to Israel or beforehand? Well, to a degree later on, in Poland, in high school, after high mm -hmm. school, we were a little bit more relaxed already. Because we never imagined that we would leave Poland. We felt we were going to live there forever. But then, when we came to Israel, 
it changed completely the, the, the outlook, the behavior, the, the, the security. And then when I came to United States, of course, didn't have any fear of anything. I mean, you're a free country. You can live, it's beautiful, nice. Don't think even what happened in the past. Keep thinking what you're going to do in the future. Um, so why, you say that you thought you were going to live in Poland forever, why did your family move to Israel and why did you then decide to move to the United States? Well, we decided to leave Poland because when we heard that Jews will be allowed to leave Poland if they go through the procedure with the government and they will approve them and give them permit to leave and go. So of course we decided because we saw there is no future in Poland for, for, for the couple Jews, two, three, four, ten Jews living in town. No relation with the Judaism, with anything. So. Now, when I came to Israel, why did I decide to go to the United States? Because Israel in those days, 1957, a new country, undeveloped, hard to get a job, no industry, no nothing. So it was very hard. So, you get a job. So who is going to get the job? A boy, not a girl, because a girl wouldn't get a job. So, in Poland, me and my sister, we went to the university. She went to medical school, I went to the law school. So when we came to Israel, can go to law school, because I don't have the language, plus I, we need to live, we need to eat. So somebody has to get a job, forget about the girl getting a job. So we decided that I go to work, and my sister is going to continue her studies. So she was accepted to the university in Jerusalem in medical school. I went to work. Hardly make the living, hardly make a few pennies. And then I was talking to mom and I say, you know, what kind of future this here, this kind of work, what? it's not good. So I say, maybe, maybe I would go to America if I could. Maybe it would be better. <laughs> <laughs> so mom says, okay, go. So she had three sisters and a brother which came here in 1920. She sent them a letter. They sent papers for me. I got the permission to come here, got to immigrate. And that's why I figured better to go here. Maybe it's better work. I can make more money in living than I could at that time in Israel. I'm glad you decided to do that. Me <laughs> <laughs> too. <laughs> Makes two of us. <laughs> How long did it take for you to learn English? I'm still learning. <laughs> 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 but uh, it took not too long at one, on a job. When I got the job, nobody spoke Polish or anything, so I had to listen and, 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 and slowly, slowly I learned and learned and start speaking, and that was it. So I am very proud, that's the word I use to, when be able to say that I am the grandson of a Holocaust survivor. What emotions do you get when you get to say that you're a Holocaust survivor? Is it pride or is it a bit of anger? So what really, what emotions arise when you say that I'm a Holocaust survivor? I think what makes me is lucky. Not pride, sure I am pride that I am alive, 
but I was lucky. The luck that the few people who survived this period of time, because very few survived, they were lucky people. No anger at all? A little bit of anger? No anger? <laughs> <laughs> Any are you, anger? Are you uh, angry at all? Or like, do you think anger, or like, that, does that ever cross your mind? You know, like, are you mad about it, or? I am mad what happened. Yes, I am mad that happened, that the world permit for this to happen, that people and leaders in this period of time kind of were blind, they didn't see, or they didn't want to see, or they went alone, and they let this to happen. So that's why I think it's important today that we have a different outlook like the old time leadership in Europe had and permitted because they saw what's going on in Germany. This doesn't happen overnight. They saw what Hitler was doing, it was obvious, and they somehow went along with him. So, if we talk about it and we teach about it today, maybe if there is somebody genius like Hitler and wants to get to power and kill everybody, maybe today's leaders will see it and wouldn't let this to happen. Sadly, we still have. Unfortunately, we do. We're not great at learning, it seems. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. Did you ever expect, like when you were teaching your own kids, um, your two girls, about uh, the Holocaust, did you ever expect that they would follow in your footsteps in the way that they, in the way that they have in writing a book, starting a foundation, going to schools and speak? Did you ever expect that they would do something like this? And, and how proud are you? And can you put it to words how proud you are of them? Well, I can just say very simple. Beyond any imagination, you cannot say how proud and happy I am of my two daughters, what they do. There is no words to say thank you to them, what they do. And I don't think you even need to say thank you. Because they feel it's right to do. I think there's a question here that you guys have that is really important and it's really uh, profound, like do you still have nightmares or there's any sound or anything that makes you go back to that moment on the, at the hiding or like the Holocaust, you know, I think sometimes, you know, you go to through life and there are certain things that bring you back to a memory. There's anything today to this day that still brings you back there or you have a nightmare about it or? Well, I'm going to say again, no, I do not have no nightmares no dreams, and I always say, thanks, Mama. Yes, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, I, I got all the right. questions I wanted to ask. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much. So uh, we have some time for some other questions from the audience, if anyone has any questions. Maybe the, the daughters that I see here, and <laughs> if anyone wants to do a question. Uncle John, uh, maybe? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have two questions that if anyone does have. Not no question. I'll ask the question. So, Dad, um, microphone. For the record. <laughs> So, Dad, uh, first I want to say, great job to all of you. I mean, really, really special and, and amazing. Dad, what message would you like to give um, leaving here today, being a Holocaust survivor and seeing your grandchildren up there with you? You go out and you speak to students. 
what message would you like to leave to say of why it's so important and to learn about the Holocaust and why we need to learn about it to make for a better future? What message would you like to say? Well, what I can say, and I'm saying that, that we should never allow to forget what happened in the past. Because if we forget, again, this may happen again. And I want to say that six million Jews were killed, but there were also five million non-Jews killed. So if Hitler will continue to be by power, probably a lot, a lot other people would be killed. So, so it's so important that we teach the young generation so they will know, their kids will know, and we have to get in touch with across all the population in the United States and try to get more and more people with us together. Because I give an example, for example, in 1936, during the Olympics, and the Olympics were in Berlin, and Hitler announced that every gold winner is going to be congratulated by him. So whoever won a gold, they brought him into a place in the stadium where Hitler was sitting. He shook his hand, congratulations. And then, in a 100 meter, American won, Jesse Owens was his name, I think, and he was a black guy. So the American leader of the team brings him over to Hitler to congratulate him for winning the gold medal. When he came close to enter his place, Whoever was his security says, what are you doing here? So he says, he won a gold medal. Hitler is going to congratulate him. So he looks at him and he says, you think our Führer will shake hand with a black guy? Sorry, go away and he didn't bring them in. It shows you that that time, Hitler already had known what he is going to do to the black people. So I say, we should get together with black people, with the Armenian people, with everybody and make sure that they understand us and we understand them because we all human beings why cannot we live together in freedom love respect to each other why do we have to live in hatreds to each other. We know that hatreds will never 
bring us to anything. It will create only more and more hatred. So let's stop this and work together so me as a Holocaust survivor doesn't have to worry that my grandkids getting married, having kids, and then they growing up, getting married and having kids, that they will not have to worry about anything, that they will have a nice life and I will have peace in the grave. Simple. Okay. Um, well, why don't we give a round of applause to <laughs> Mark? Um, it's always just the most immense honor to be able to hear from a survivor. Um, we're so grateful, Mark, for you being here, bringing your incredible grandchildren for this amazing conversation. I know it will have meaning for years and years to come. I'd like to thank Isabella Fisk and Ann Arnold. Um, it was mentioned during the event, but the Mark Schoenwetter Holocaust Education Foundation. You can find information about it. Um, we appreciate everything Mark does as a member of our Speakers Bureau and uh, how you go out and spread the message of Never Forgetting and the museum's mission with um, younger audiences and all types of people. I'd like to also thank uh, Maddie Kramer. I know Alexis is here from Pickle Music. They are the producers of the podcast. Um, this episode, I don't know exactly when it'll be available, but um, sometime soon be on the lookout for that. Maybe Maddie yeah. can share. Uh, thank you so much. I know it's a bit late also. Uh, hopefully soon the, the episode will be out. Thank you so, so much for being part of this. Uh, we're so lucky to have you and all the questions and all the things you have. So thank you again for everything. We're really happy for this. Thank you too for everything yeah. for you. Thank you so much, everyone. We'll see you back here at the museum soon. Hope you have a wonderful day. Uh, and again, be on the lookout for upcoming public programs. You can see them on our website. We do host the Story Survive series monthly. Um, and I know we will be doing more with Mark in the future. Thank you again. Take care, everyone. Thank you.